by Calvo's Insurance, a legacy of trust, serving Micronesia since 1938. Matson and the Adahi Tano Program. Cars Plus, home of Guam's first and only lifetime limited powertrain warranty. McDonald's of Guam, I'm loving it, and King's Restaurants. Always open, always local, and serving up favorites for over 40 years. Head on primetime, the governor issues an executive order extending the public health emergency declaration. Plus, within the week, 11 employees with the Department of Corrections test positive for the virus. And the island records its 76 COVID-related deaths since mid-March. Half a day and good evening, everyone. The public health emergency that was set to expire on Friday has been extended. The governor issued a new executive order today to continue it for another 30 days. The new EO also cites a section of the Health Powers Act that, quote, expressly authorizes public health and other affected agencies to enforce the act through the imposition of fines and penalties. It indicates both DPHSS and GPD plan to coordinate enforcement efforts. The order further calls for the temporary suspension of regulatory procedures that would hinder or delay necessary action by DPHSS to respond to the COVID-19 public health emergency. In short, it provides for the speedy adoption and implementation of what it describes as critical regulations. We are still waiting on the details of what those regulations will allow for. Meanwhile, a 48-year-old man died this afternoon, marking the island's 76th COVID-19 related fatality. According to the Joint Information Center, the man who had underlying health conditions tested positive for the virus upon admission to the Guam Memorial Hospital on October 5th. He died at GMH at around 12.26 p.m. today. Meanwhile, the Archdiocese of Agania announced it will honor all those who've died from COVID with special prayers and crosses at the Cathedral Basilica on Monday. All Souls Day. And according to the latest COVID results from the Joint Information Center, of the 591 samples run from various labs, 82 tested positive. Of the new cases, 26 were identified through contact tracing and three were identified in quarantine. To date, there have been a total of 4,418 cases of COVID-19. With 75 deaths, 1,732 people are actively fighting the infection, while 2,611 have recovered. The Guam Memorial Hospital's COVID census rises yet again. Administrator Lillian Posadas reports there are now 83 COVID patients hospitalized. 13 are currently receiving an ICU level of care, with five patients placed on ventilator support. 14 of the 83 patients hospitalized are currently in recovery at the CIF in Barragata Heights. According to the JIC report, Guam Regional Medical City's COVID census shows two COVID hospitalizations with one patient receiving ICU level of care. In addition, Posadas confirms that 15 more nurses arrived last night to assist the already overwhelmed hospital. Nurses in this recent batch specialize in telemetry and ICU care and will be on island for the next 13 weeks. The Department of Corrections confirms five recruits and six officers assigned to the Mangila prison have tested positive for COVID-19. Adriana Cotero speaks with DOC's Major Anton Uggen, who breaks down the chain of infections. So it started about last week. Uh, last week we had officers that were, they were already off work. They were actually on personal leave, uh, reported that they, uh, they uh, contracted COVID-19. Then later in the week, Department of Correction recruits assigned to the Manilao Adult Corrections Facility perimeter duties reported they had been in contact with a COVID-19 positive patient. That's according to DOC spokesperson Major Anton Uggen, who says a total of five recruits tested positive and were immediately secured from duty. Through DOC contact tracing, more officers were then determined as close contacts and tested positive for the virus, explains Uggen. And we had other officers that had come in contact with the officers that uh, tested positive. And so we started sending them home. And a few of them, uh, eventually a few days later, developed some symptoms and they got tested and they were positive. So it kind of like, it just kind of kept getting more and more officers as, as the week went on. A total of six DOC officers have since tested positive for COVID-19 with an additional 19 determined as close contacts who are all on home quarantine for 14 days.
three of the officers were already on leave when they contact when they uh, contracted COVID. So they weren't on the compound. They were already on leave. And uh, the other three, I believe, uh, they are uh, part of from our, our special operations response team. With nearly 30 DOC personnel off duty, Major Uggen says they have made a few adjustments to operations, but haven't experienced a major impact. We're going to, again, uh, get through this and, and we expect some of the officers that are in quarantine to start heading back next week. So I, I, we're pretty much got this handled and, uh, for now. While DOC waits for remaining test results to return, he says they are monitoring the inmate and detainee population, which to date is COVID free. With one of the officers that tested positive, uh, he was at a housing unit. And so we tested all the uh, 20 inmates that were housed there and the 10 officers that were uh, around in close contact with this officer that it tested positive. Uh, that was done this past Sunday, the 25th. And all the results from that test testing uh, came back negative. Uggen adds the department is in communication with public health should they need to conduct testing at both facilities again. We're still holding strong. We're just going to continue to, to, you know, um, do our best to ensure that it doesn't get into our population and that we remind the staff to, you know, use your, wear your mask and, you know, when you're going off, get off duty, you know, uh, you know, please, you know, best as possible, refrain from going out in the community and, and possibly catching this thing. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Adriana Cotero. An employee with the Guam Regional Transit Authority has tested positive for the virus, according to Director Selba Balta. The employee is currently at GMH. He says three staff members who are identified as close contacts are self-quarantining. GRTA trans tr paratransit and fixed route operations are unaffected and will continue normal operations. GRTA continues to perform mitigation measures, which include sanitization of buses and vans twice daily in the afternoon and evening in preparation for morning operations. Enforce social distancing, providing hand sanitizing wipes to riders, ensuring all riders wear face masks and providing face masks to riders who do not have one. On Tuesday, a firefighter assigned to the Stumbo Fire Station tested positive. According to Fire Department spokesperson Kevin Riley, the firefighter was feeling ill prior to reporting to work and tested later that day at GMH. The firefighter remains in home isolation because the member is part of the COVID transport unit. Contact tracing to determine if transmission happened during work or at home is not possible. Until testing is completed in the next few days, Riley says cohort quarantining the DPHSS approved practice of grouping asymptomatic personnel who were exposed to the positive member is in effect for the remaining personnel assigned to a Stumbo. Adjustments will be made in scheduling for the firefighters assigned. Meanwhile, the six GFD personnel identified as close contacts to a firefighter who tested positive COVID-19 and was assigned to the incident command post at GFD headquarters have all come back negative. It was last week when two firefighters had tested positive, positive as a result of household exposure. The second firefighter is assigned to the Umatic Fire Station. Decontamination was done at both locations. Firefighters at Umatic were tested previously and all came back negative. And a total of five GFD emergency medical dispatchers from the 911 call center all came back negative with the results after being tested uh, Tuesday morning. As we reported, it was on Friday that 9-11 operations were temporarily relocated to both GFD and GPD headquarters after a uh, police civilian supporter tested positive for COVID-19. The area was deep cleaned and sanitized before operations returned to normal Saturday morning. The GPD positive employee remains in home isolation. Results for the GPD dispatchers were not available as of news time. And despite many weeks now under PCOR-1, the spread of the virus is not abating. Physicians Advisory Group member Dr. Felix Cabrera says they've been looking for answers even in other jurisdictions, including a Native American tribe that once had one of the highest infection rates, but now has it under control. We know that when Navajo Nation started really declining in their cases was when they instituted the, the 57-hour weekend lockdown in addition to their nightly uh, uh, curfews. And then when they got down to a good level, they, they relaxed it to about a 32 hour from Saturday night until, until Monday morning. 
Cabrera isn't saying Guam's reached that point yet, but he does say there are simple things we can do, like keeping a mask on in public places, that will drastically reduce transmission. The thing is that we shouldn't need an order to do that and to understand that. So um, I'm making a plea out to, to everyone uh, on Guam and, and, and anywhere else, you know, please don't don't eat with somebody who's not in your same of your same household, your primary residence, I should say. But because it goes against what we're used to, it will take discipline and commitment, which Cabrera says most have, but some don't. There are so many people in Guam doing the right thing, and they're doing it so well. And when we see continue rise in this, this is what really contributes to their fatigue, is for those few that are not compliant. And he doesn't believe it's because of ill intent, more because they let their guard down. His reminder, keep your guard up, especially outside of your home, 100% of the time. Back with more news right after this break. Social distancing may be the new norm, but connection will always be our tradition. Through good times and tough times, we remain connected with you. Mass may be the new fashion, but protection will always be our style. You can always count on us to protect the things that matter the most. Sanitizing may be the new routine, but caring will always be our practice. We care about your loved ones and the things you value the most. And as we welcome our new normal, one thing remains certain. We will always be here for you. We're open and ready to serve you. Calvo's Insurance, a legacy of trust. Half a day, I'm Amanda Shelton. Thank you for the honor to serve as your Senator. I humbly ask for one of your votes this election to continue providing for our families protecting our Manamku, preparing our youth, preserving our environment, and promoting health and safety for our entire community. Please vote Amanda Shelton, number six, Democrat. Thank you. Half a day, I'm Elaine Tamanyal Johnson and I'm voting for Joe S. Sonaga State. Woohoo! Half a day, go ahead and Joe Messman. Hafiday, I'm Crystal Augustine. I'm from Alessu and I'm voting for Joe. Ako si Winston Ilicita. Iboto natin si Joe San Agustin for Senator. Mamuhay. I'm Senator Joe Shimizu San Augustine and I approve this message. Let your voice be heard, Guam. Your vote is your voice. The Guam Association of Realtors Political Action Committee is a bipartisan group actively supporting candidates who will pass laws that protect the real estate industry and the community as a whole. Visit their website at guamrealtors.com slash vote to learn more about the key issues they are advancing and the candidates they are supporting to protect and promote home ownership and property rights on Guam. people of Guam in this election is the kind of service that is predicated upon integrity and honesty and trust. Not Robert Underwood just candidate for Congress. This is Robert Underwood with a whole bunch of people running for Congress. And that's all of you, ladies and gentlemen. All of you are running for Congress. This is not a one-man show. This is a movement. This is a movement for dignity. This is a movement for trustworthiness. This is a movement for integrity. I'm standing up for you all the time. I will fight with everything I got. I'm Robert, and I approve this message. KUAM News, winner of the 2020 Regional Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Social Media. Welcome back. 
The Supreme Court of Guam has reversed the conviction of a man in the death of his friend. J.C. White was found guilty in 2017 of aggravated assault for punching Brian Cruz while they and other friends were out partying for the night. A video of the punch was captured on a two-month surveillance camera and went viral on social media. White successfully argued that the trial court committed plain error when it failed to instruct the jury on the government's burden to disprove his justification defense beyond a reasonable doubt. White had asserted that he punched Cruz in defense of another of their friends. The decision, written by Justice Catherine Merriman and concurred by Chief Justice Philip Carbolito and Justice Robert Torres, further determined that reversal is, a necessary, is necessary to prevent a miscarriage of justice and to maintain the in integrity of the judicial process. The case was remanded back for a new trial. The Guam Police Department's Administration Services Bureau in the Hakubotan building in Tamuning was closed early, early this morning after Chief of Police Stephen Ignacio was made aware of a threat to a tenant. Operations affecting GPD's Armory Division and Recreational Boating and Safety were also closed as investigators determined the credibility of the threat or locate the person responsible. GPD says it will announce more information as it becomes available. Her last day on the job is supposed to be this Friday, but KOAM has learned that Chamorro Affairs Director Arlene Santos has rescinded her resignation. It was last week that KOAM reported that Santos, who is also acting Guam Public Library System Director, tendered her resignation effective October 30th. Adloop Press Secretary Crystal Paco San Augustine, however, confirms that Santos has since rescinded that. San Augustine says the governor is reviewing the issue and has yet to decide whether she will keep Santos on board. The governor appointed Santos as DCA president back in June. And more than 10,000 voters have already cast their ballots in the 2020 general election. GEC Executive Director Maria Pangilinan. We've accommodated 10,163 voters, uh, both curbside and upstairs on the third floor and our satellite location. The voter count does not include the over 500 homebound and 66 off-island voters. This week, the GEC is conducting the final week of early voting. Friday, the very last day for early voting. Right. We won't take appointments. We will have two lines upstairs. The two lines upstairs, one line will be dedicated for the Manumku persons with disabilities and per persons with medical challenges. For voters that are in quarantine and isolation, Pangalinan says the GEC dropped off flyers to the facilities yesterday, asking residents to contact their office for further information. In addition, GEC staff attended training at GMH on servicing COVID patients, which will start this weekend. Election day, of course, is next Tuesday, November 3rd. We're now less than a week away from that general election, as I mentioned, and in an unprecedented year that's been dominated by the coronavirus, we asked the chairpersons of the two main political parties just how much they think the government of Guam's response to the pandemic will weigh on voters' choices. Here's what Democrat Sarah Nettedog and Republican Tony Atta had to say. I think that we're doing the best that we can in terms of um, what the government is doing in its leadership. I mean... As you said, Nestor, this is, these are unprecedented times. I mean, even in the United States, globally, people are trying to figure out how to get a vaccine. What is it that we're going to do to ensure that this virus is stopped? I'm just so happy that we have at the helm a healthcare provider. I mean, it's like divine intervention, you know, because we have someone that understands health and and understands healthcare that's leading the executive branch. The government, I believe, has done the best that they could do, just like any of the, the world governments. Um, were there mixed messages coming out from the administrator, the administration, and the, and the physician advisory group? Absolutely. But I think as they moved along, they, they worked together, they brought their messaging together to come out with uh, one, one message. And I think that's what people are looking for. We'll have lots more with the party chairpersons on our in full Zoom segment later in the newscast. They'll talk about economic recovery and their predictions for next week's election. Officials are still keeping an eye on January as the target month for returning to school. 
The Education Department is launching a dashboard tomorrow that it plans to update weekly. Superintendent John Fernandez says every Friday they brief the Education Board on the dashboard, which presents the assessment of risk levels for returning. The numbers that we're looking at, we're, we're, we're hovering around 700 uh, new cases over a 14-day period uh, just these last two weeks. Um, and the, the target to get into low risk is to have less than 20. So we're really much higher than we, you know, we need to be uh, on, that, on that metric. And then as far as the positivity rate goes, again, to get to a low, um, into the lower range of risk, we got to get below 5%. And we're hovering around 13 to 14 percent over the last 14 days. So a lot of work to do. Fernandez says that the reopening depends on the governor and public health announcing it's safe to proceed. He says once given the go, GDOE will be ready. They also plan to engage the community through three surveys, surveys leading up to January. We have teams that are putting those surveys together because we do want the input from our parents, our students and teachers. So we believe there'll be one in November um, early December and then one prior to the opening uh, target date in January. The Guam Education Board meets every Friday afternoon. Coming up, regional headlines from KSPN2 News. Don't go away. Your community calendar is brought to you by Taco Bell. Whether it's your first meal or your fourth meal, we've got you covered. Taco Bell, live Moss. I know that declaring war on corruption is an invitation for hurtful attacks and half-truths against me and my service to the people. But I also know the people of Guam are stronger and smarter than these dishonest players whose misdeeds and acts of corruption have cost us millions in political payoffs this year alone. If we allow corruption to continue, we all lose. Let's put an end to corruption. Vote Joanne Brown for senator. My name is Joanne Brown and I approve this message. Paid for by the committee to elect Joanne M. Brown for senator. going out each day, doing what they can to hold us all together. We're here to help those helping us all by keeping our lights on. Hafidi Guam, this is Telu Tidy Wee. Fighting for you has been my honor, regardless of the politics and the challenges we faced. I've worked hard every day to improve GMH facilities, fund security cameras for public safety, support road repairs, and call out legislation and decisions that break the people's trust in government. The fight for these priorities isn't over. It's just begun. I'm Talo Tariwi. I approve this message and humbly ask for your vote. Situ Smasi, maraming salamat po. Thank you, Guam. Hey, you guys, how far are you ready? We're ready! Ready to move in a positive direction. Ready to move forward. Are you ready? I am ready. Are you? Biba Underwood for Congress. Man, let's do Biba, vote begins for... Robert Underwood! Yeah! In an hour that you told me how to own my bota, Senor Robert Underwood. Sonia is ready! Biba Underwood! Robert Underwood for Congress! The Alvarez family from Jigo is voting for Robert Underwood. Are you ready? I am ready. We, we are, are ready, ready for Robert, Robert Underwood. Underwood. I'm voting for Robert Underwood. I'm supporting Robert Underwood. Are you ready? We're, We're ready. ready! Eva Underwood for Congress. Are you ready? I'm ready! ready. Welcome back. With regional headlines, here's KSPN2 News. Hafa Guam, here are the headlines for CNMI. 
Governor's authorized representative Patrick Guerrero says the CNMI has enough personal protective equipment to last the next three to six months. Uh, we really haven't purchased uh, much actually uh, since uh, May uh, when we uh, you know, took advantage and got a lot of bulk orders. Uh, we're good, I think, for the next uh, three to six months comfortably. Um, and that's, I hope that's uh, reassuring to the people out there um, that, uh, you know, we stocked up really early and we've even uh, uh, found at one point uh, to, you know, share some of it with our um, neighbors, uh, brothers and sisters down south uh, who were having a, a difficult time getting some uh, PPEs during the their early surge. We shared some with them. Guerrero says around $80 million has been obligated to various contracts to protect the people of the CNMI against COVID-19. Uh, how much is actually uh, expended at the end of the day? My, my accounting would probably put the number in the high 60s. So although we signed uh, over $80 million in contracts, we don't usually use up the whole sum of those contracts. Uh, how much more do <laughs> depends now on uh, how much longer we, uh, we need to fight this uh, disease. Many of the purchases made for COVID-19 protective equipment are reimbursed by FEMA with a local cost share of 10%. And Guerrero says the cost being incurred is tailing off. But the level of spending has really dropped from, uh, you know, we, we got a lot of stuff in the beginning, a lot of uh, equipment, um, and we've su we supported uh, quarantine at one point. We had two hotels and closed one down and still picked up another one. We're still running two quarantine facilities. Um, so the, the, the cost, uh, um, you know, uh, was heavy in the, in, at the front uh, and it's kind of tailing off, but that doesn't mean we might not see a spike. It, it's all, it, it looks like it's relative to the number of cases and the threat. So uh, we're prepared. For more news, visit SiapanTV.com. For KSPN2 News, I'm Ashley McDowell. I am the future. We are the future. The future leaders. Businesswoman. Please keep us in mind when you vote. Don't choose more of the same. John Annanich is unique and new. Focus on the mission of making our island safer. And securing our future. I. I am the future. Vote for John Annanich. For Visit us at johnannanich.com and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. I'm John Annanich and I approve this message. You could upgrade to the sparkly sprinkle pack on Cupcake Conquest. Or you could upgrade to all this. Two crunchy tacos and a medium drink. Plus the beefy cheesy layers of the Grande Stacker Box. Only at Taco Bell. 100% truck, 100% Jeep brand. The all-new Jeep Gladiator is the most capable off-road mid-size pickup truck crafted for adventure. Equipped with best-in-class towing capacity, legendary Jeep brand 4x4 capability, and backed by Guam's only lifetime powertrain warranty. Drive home in a brand new Jeep Gladiator today, starting as low as $283 per paycheck during Jeep Adventure Days. Call us at 477-7807 or visit our website at carsplusguam.com to get pre-approved today. Let your voice be heard, Guam. Your vote is your voice. The Guam Association of Realtors Political Action Committee is a bipartisan group actively supporting candidates who will pass laws that protect the real estate industry and the community as a whole. Visit their website at guamrealtors.com slash vote to learn more about the key issues they are advancing and the candidates they are supporting to protect and promote home ownership and property rights on Guam. And before we close out the news tonight, our latest round of birthday shout-outs from the Cold Stone Creamery Birthday Club. Everybody say it with me now. <clears throat> Here we go. 
Happy birthday on this October 28th to Danito Cepeda. Happy birthday to DJ. Hope you have a fun-filled square and circle kind of day. But don't monkey around too much. We love you more than you love ketchup. That is awesome. Jeanette Flory, happy birthday. All our love and well wishes from the Guam Department of Public Health and Social Services Traveler Quarantine Crew. Hey, thanks a lot for the job that you guys do. Keep your head up. Keep working hard. We do appreciate it. And happy birthday, Jeanette. And Salvador Avia, happy birthday, Sal. We love you, Papa. Say your girls. And what would the birthday shout-out be without belated birthday wishes? First, going off to Ana C. Umpinko, who was born on October the 27th. Happy birthday number 97 to Grandma Ana. Thank you for everything. We love you. And we send you big, big hugs. And God bless you always. Happy birthday, Ana. Bob Snover, born on the 27th. Happy birthday to the most hardworking man we know. We love you. And Paige Serenity Cruz. Happy first birthday, Paige. We love you to the moon and back. But those are six awesome Guamanians. Each of them is a valued member of our community. We appreciate them, we love them, and we all wish each and every one of them, and you, a happy birthday. That's our report for tonight. Thanks for watching. Stay safe, everyone. In Full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. Hello day, everyone. I'm Nestor Leconta. Welcome to another edition of In Full Zoom. Our guests this week are the uh, respective chairpersons of the two main political parties on Guam. We have uh, Sarah Thomas Nenadog for the Democrats and Tony Adam for the Republicans. Welcome, guys. Hello day, Nestor. Hello day, Guam. Hello day, Buenos. I appreciate your being here. I know we're just about a, uh, less than a week away from the uh, general election. So I mm -hmm. wanted to give you guys an opportunity to uh, just respond to uh, a few questions that we have. And uh, first and foremost, uh, let me start with you, Sarah, ladies first. What do you think would be the most important issue for voters in this particular election? Well, I think there is no if, ands, or buts about that. I think our people are concerned first and foremost about their health and safety. So I think people want to know what, what are our leaders doing to better ensure that uh, our people are safe, that we stay healthy. And of course, you know, how are we going to get this economy back on track? Because people have to get back to work. They need to start generating money. So how do we mesh all these uh, issues that are so important to us? So I think that's what it's going to be. It's going to be health and it's going to be our safety and it's going to be the economy, no doubt. All right, Tony, what, what about you? What do you think are they going to be the main issues that voters are going to be looking at for this particular uh, election? Yeah, no, sir. I, I believe it's going to be the pocketbook issues, right? How do they continue to put food on the table? How do they pay the bills? Um, how are they going to pay the mortgage and the utilities? And I think that uh, when our people look at what's been going on this past seven months, and, you know, it's very fortunate that uh, we have the, the uh, pandemic assistance from both the federal government uh, coming out to assist the, the businesses with the PPP program and also those that uh, became unemployed. So the issue is going to become where are we going to be at in the next couple of months and what is our government doing to um, strengthen our economy and, 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 and stabilize it so that uh, if, if you saw the news this morning, uh, there was an issue about a tsunami of bankruptcies. And I think that's the fear of a lot of people is that they don't want to go through a bankruptcy proceeding, uh, possibly losing their house, uh, you know, things like that. So I, I truly believe it's going to be the pocketbook, uh, pocketbook issues that are the uh, number one in a lot of people's minds. Okay, I'm going to ask you a little bit more about the economy later, but Sarah, I wanted to get back to you. You said that uh, health and safety is going to be the uh, one of the primary issues, and I agree with that. But um, what do you think um, is is the government doing a good job in this unprecedented uh, pandemic that we're all faced with, uh, even you know throughout the globe? Is the government uh, of Guam um, is it handling the uh, pandemic uh, right in your mind? I think that we're doing the best that we can in terms of um, what the government is doing in its leadership. I mean, as you said, Nestor, this is, these are unprecedented times. I mean, even in the United States, 
globally, people are trying to figure out how to get a vaccine. What is it that we're going to do to ensure that this virus is stopped and that we don't face anything like this? I mean, this is a major global shutdown. I'm really, um, I think I, I, I'm just so happy that we have at the helm a healthcare provider. I mean, it's like divine intervention, you know, because we have someone that understands health and, and understands healthcare that's leading the executive branch. What better person? I think also we have a lot to learn from our regional uh, friends who many of the islands around us in the Pacific have low cases of, of um, the virus. And I think that us holding hands with them, having um, conversations with them and joining together in regional prevention strategies is the way forward for us. I mean, we can't just look, we can look internally at our resources and our needs, but I think we really need to work very closely with our region and learn what are the things that they're doing? What are some natural uh, ways in which we can keep our families safe and boost our health? And that's really the key as uh, we move forward is how do we keep healthy and how do we keep safe? And if you don't have that, you can't talk about anything else because you need to have a healthy workforce in order to stimulate the economy. It's gonna be slow and it's gonna be painful, mm -hmm. but it's something we have to do. We've gotta walk that. We've gotta get through this journey together. All right, Tony, uh, same question to you. Uh, how do you think the uh, government of Guam has been handling this pandemic now heading into, I think our, our eighth, eighth month, yeah? Yeah, you know, I, I agree with Sarah. Uh, this is something that no one's ever expected. Uh, the government, I believe, has done the best that they could do, just like any of the, the world governments. Um, were there mixed messages coming out from the administrator, the administration, and the, and the physician advisory group? Absolutely. But I think as they moved along, they, they worked together, they brought their messaging together to come out with uh, one, one message. And I think that's what people are looking for is trust in our government. How can we trust our government to provide us with the accurate information that is needed so that we can learn to, this is a pandemic that we're gonna have to learn to live with. Um, it's just like the flu, trying to learn to live with the flu. Uh, the uh, COVID-19, we're gonna try to learn to live with it among us because uh, keeping our mask on, keeping our hands washed, staying healthy, like Sarah said, is going to be very important in bringing and uh, rebuilding our economy, uh, bringing tourists back to our island, but most especially just to live amongst one another and to be cohesive as an island because we're the only ones that can make it happen to move our island forward. In Full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's, offers fully covered loading and unloading area with individual pin-coated gate and door access. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. Guam's Auto Appearance Specialist, Elegant Reflections, has been providing the automotive industry with professional detailing and car care products at its highest quality from complete detailing, full interior detailing, exterior detailing, headlamp restoration, hand washing, seat and carpet shampoo, engine degreasing, undercarriage cleaning, paint sealant, fabric protection, paint oxidation removal, and so much more. Visit us at our new location. Call 646-5555 for an appointment. Elegant Reflections, Guam's Auto Appearance Specialist. Over 20 years of experience. MTO Maintenance will now completely sanitize your home, office, or business with state-of-the-art commercial sprayers. For over 30 years, MTO Maintenance has been committed to the health and safety of our customers. And now, more than ever, a clean home, office, carpets, and furniture is a necessity to our island. Give us a call today. Stay healthy and stay safe, Guam. Call 647-6861 for an appointment. It's been very hard 
especially the very few months, it was very uncertain. Now that we had the opportunity to do something, to bring some norm to our life, why not do it? So I just encourage everybody out there who has the right to vote, please go ahead and do it because it counts. My name is Francesca Peña and I'm the face behind Akiti Candle. I'm out here today at Skinner Plaza like every Thursday to encourage you to get out there and vote. It counts. In Full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. Yeah, there, there seems to be a division within the community and not just Guam. I'm talking about, you know, stateside as well. Uh, between those who believe that, uh, you know, in, in order to preserve health and maintain, you know, uh, safety, that we need to uh, shut down um, certain uh, aspects of the economy. And there's a, another train of thought that we should open the economy as, as much as possible or open it completely. Um, what do you, uh, Tony, let me stick with you. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? What, what should we be doing? I mean, we're right now in a PCOR 1 status uh, for a number of weeks, although um, the governor has loosened restrictions on certain businesses. So um, uh, what, what do you think she should be doing? Well, you know, I'm not in the governor's shoes, and I and I know that she has a lot of advisors uh, around her that are guiding her through this pandemic. Uh, what we can do is actually, like I said previously, right? We need to learn to live with this virus, um, because the the longer we stay in, in indoors, I think uh, will just enhance it will it will enhance the problem instead of trying to solve the problem, right? And I think that once we learn to live with it and everyone, they, they put these certain protocols in place. I mean, we're already, a lot of people, when you go out there, you see them wearing their masks, you see the hand sanitizers. I mean, if we do that on a daily basis and just stick to the plan, stick to the program, I think we'd be able to merge and enjoy both being out there and the businesses opening so that we can continue to rebuild the economy. Uh, but I think the governor has done what she needs to do. And like I said, she, she has her physicians there that are guiding her. And, you know, we can all be arm, uh, uh, what they call them, armchair quarterbacks, right? But she has to make the decision. And she has those advisors that are next to her, helping her through this. And any way that we can help, we're always glad to assist. I mean, even with our, even with my business, we do what the governor tells us to do. And continue to do the protocols and put those protocols protocols in place so that we can enjoy the, the camaraderie of, of one another, right? And not only that, but when people come to, to pay their respects to their loved ones, they'll be able to do it openly and safely, knowing that when they come and they leave, they're going to be safe. And, and Sarah, so far the governor has resisted some of the calls to reopen the uh, economy um, uh, completely. Uh, in the name of uh, health and safety, which you alluded to earlier, do you think she's doing a good job so far? Absolutely. I mean, short of calling for an island-wide total shutdown, and that means like, you know, when you think about a typhoon, right? When it, when it's a typhoon uh, or, or condition of readiness one, typhoon condition is what we grew up with, right? So when it gets to two, we already know we got to like get our stuff and stay home and get ready. And when we're in one, nobody goes out. The only one that's out is really like the, uh, the police and, and uh, safe people that are trying to like re repair, you know, the, the poles or whatever. But the bottom line is PCOR 1 is a real statement of seriousness of this, uh, this pandemic. And uh, it's amazing to me that even given uh, the escalation of us going to PCOR uh, 1, that people still are in disbelief or are non-compliant you know, with the measures. And what is it? Stay home. Only go out if you have to go to the doctors or the grocery store you know, urgent things. Don't have family gatherings. You know, personal uh, uh, hygiene is critical. And, and most of all, she has been encouraging us to do healthy things. Use this time 
to learn about what we can do to boost our immunity, what we can do to stay healthy, how we can support the members of our family so that they stay healthy as well. I mean, that's like the key. Let's use our time wisely, somewhat of a downtime uh, for us in terms of we're not going to the movies, which is my fave. We're not going out and visiting friends and having parties. So we should be at home really finding out what is it that we can do to improve our own health and boost our immunity. So I think she's really taken the lead there. And I know that our democratic senators have been right there uh, alongside her saying the same thing. It's like, come on, uh, folks, we've got this Guam, stay home, stay healthy, mask up and do whatever you can to encourage other people to do the same. All right, so Tony, um, let's talk a little bit about the economy. Um, you know, obviously the the downfall in the, uh, the the downturn in the uh, tourism industry has really decimated the economy. What is the plan? Uh, what? How do we um, recover? What is the your uh, the Republican economic recovery plan? Well, what we need to do, less uh, necessary, is to actually work within ourselves before we try to bring in tourism, right? And that's uh, like I said. What do we do to put protocols in place? How do we get restaurants to reopen? How do we get our hotels to reopen being that they can be safe so that when tourists come in, that they know that they're gonna be safe as well. And it's the protocols and procedures that each establishment and each business is responsible for doing so that they know that the employees and the visitors are both safe. But at the same time, it's government working with private. How is it that instead of trying to close businesses or trying to uh, penalize businesses. What is it that we can do to work with each other? Uh, that's the only way that our government is going to be able to increase the the, uh, the tax base because currently I, I think our, our tax base has greatly diminished and it's the private sector that keeps government moving. So we need to work together to reopen the economy. We need to work together to put a, a plan together that will say this is the procedures that we have in place. Uh, let's get the businesses to follow it and let's get our economy and, and our tourism back into the island. But we need to start from the inside before we move to the outside. All right, Sarah, what, what, what should be the economic recovery plan? You know, Nestor, I think what, what we need to look um, at that we probably haven't spent as much time doing in the past is looking internally. In other words, looking at what are our assets here on the ground? What is it that we're good at here on Guam? And even as I shared earlier in the region, because I think that's really gonna be the answer to our socioeconomic future, you know, and prosperity and health is what is it that we have here on Guam? So if it's, if it's uh, our waters, our, our land, you know, fishing, agriculture, all those things that we can manage here, like we're doing now, we have so uh, limited access uh, to, to outside of, of Guam and the region, right? So we need to re-examine what are our assets? What are our people asset, 